In today's video, I'll be discussing a group of abnormalities that are frequently referred to collectively as QRST changes. The primary learning objectives will be first, to distinguish a pathologic from non-pathologic Q wave, second, to define R wave progression and list its variations and their etiologies, and last, to identify common abnormalities of the ST segment and T wave and to list their common etiologies. I'll first talk about Q waves, starting with an explanation as to why small, non-pathologic Q waves are often seen in most leads. They are due to a left to right depolarization of the septum and thus are often referred to as septal Q waves. We can illustrate these septal Q waves with a schematic of an axial cross section of the heart and examination of leads V1 and V6. As you may know from prior videos in this series, the left to right depolarization of the septum is the first event in ventricular depolarization. Since this vector is directed towards V1 and away from V6, the initial deflection in the QRS complex in those leads is positive and negative respectively. But then since the bulk of the myocardial mass is in the left ventricle, the majority of the subsequent depolarization vector is negative in V1 and positive in V6. Therefore, V1 should have a small R wave followed by a deep S wave, and V6 should have a small Q wave followed by a tall R wave. As you can see, V6 often has a small S wave as well, the origin of which is irrelevant for routine EKG interpretation and is beyond the scope of this video. If this is where a physiologic or septal Q wave comes from, what is a pathologic Q wave? The presence of a pathologic Q wave is indicated by any of the following. A duration of 30 or more milliseconds, a presence in leads V1, V2, or V3. Now I've seen some resources state that a Q wave in V1 can be normal, but the most authoritative sources state otherwise. The reason for the conflicting statements may be a conflation of the idea of a pathologic Q wave and a Q wave indicative of infarction. In other words, an isolated Q wave in V1 does not necessarily suggest a prior infarct, but it nevertheless likely indicates some type of alternative pathology, the possibilities of which I'll list in a minute. A final possible indicator of a pathologic Q wave is when the depth of the Q wave is equal to or exceeds either one third or one fourth of the R wave height. I put a question mark here because this particular criteria is inconsistently defined and subsequently inconsistently applied. Here's an example of a normal EKG. If we zoom in on leads V5 and V6, we can see the tiny downward deflections at the beginning of the QRS complexes. These are septal Q waves. To strongly contrast those, here's an EKG from a patient with a left bundle branch block with very prominent Q waves in V1 through V3 as a consequence of that. And here is a patient with a prior inferior MI and Q waves in 2, 3, and AVF. The Q wave in AVF is of slightly different morphology as it is arguably either a notched Q wave or actually a tiny Q followed by a tiny R, followed by a large S. Even if this latter case were true and the actual Q component of the overall QRS complex in this lead was very small, it would still be appropriate to consider it pathologic, given both its context within its own QRS complex, as well as its context within the other inferior leads. Last, in this EKG, there are pathologic Q waves in 1 and AVL, which are not the consequence of true cardiac pathology, but rather the consequence of the right arm and left arm wires being accidentally switched by the person recording the EKG. Let me now run through the etiologies of pathologic Q waves, and there are many. Most of these have already been covered or will be covered in other videos in this series. The most common, arguably most significant etiology is a subacute or old MI, a finding which has historically been referred to as a Q wave MI. The typical location of the Q waves is over the infarcted myocardium. Next, there are various conduction abnormalities. In a left bundle branch block, pathologic Q waves are universally present in V1 through V3, as we just saw, and may also be seen in leads 3 and AVF. 
In left anterior fascicular block, relatively smaller Q waves are seen in 1 and AVL. In left posterior fascicular block, they are seen in 2, 3, and AVF. Following an acute PE, an isolated Q wave is occasionally seen in lead 3, which is a component of the S1, Q3, T3 pattern. The remainder of the etiologies are progressively more esoteric and include infiltrative diseases such as amyloidosis, Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, myocarditis, myocardial contusion, chest wall deformities, and as shown a moment ago, lead reversal. The appearance of Q waves in all of the etiologies, aside from the prior MI, is occasionally referred to as a pseudo-infarct pattern, as these other diseases are frequently mistaken for prior MIs. In my experience, this mistake is most often made with infiltrative diseases, since most of the other etiologies listed will often have additional EKG findings suggesting the correct diagnosis. I'll now move on to discuss the topic of R-wave progression. This refers to the pattern by which the R to S ratio gradually increases as one moves across the precordium from V1 to V6. The so-called zone of transition, which is the point at which the R to S ratio crosses 1, normally occurs between V2 and V3, or V3 and V4. Here's an example of normal R-wave progression. The term poor R-wave progression is frequently used to non-specifically describe any form of abnormal progression. Progression may be abnormal because it's delayed, that is, the transition zone is between V4 and V5, or between V5 and V6. Alternatively, R-wave progression may be said to be absent, in which there is no transition zone at all in the conventional 12-lead EKG, that is, the R-wave is shorter than the S-wave is deep in all precordial leads. Etiologies of delayed or absent R-wave progression are limited to subacute or old anterior or anteroceptal MI, as a manifestation of the pulmonary disease pattern seen in COPD, as a consequence of either LVH or RVH, left anterior fascicular block, or electrode misplacement, specifically electrodes V3 through V6 being placed too medially. Another form of abnormal R-wave progression is called reverse progression, in which the maximal R to S ratio occurs in either V1 or V2. Aside from right bundle branch blocks, this is otherwise rare, and other etiologies are essentially limited to certain subtypes of RVH and dextrocardia. The next category of QRST changes is ST elevation. There are two major morphologic subtypes. Here is the first. This is typically referred to as concave upwards due to the fact that the transition from the ST segment into the T wave follows a contour like this. And here is the second. This is known predictably as convex upwards. When the convex upwards morphology is as pronounced as this one is, it is often referred to as tombstoning, which is because the ST segment mimics the shape of a tombstone and also because this morphology is almost exclusively seen in large ST elevation MIs. More generally, ST segment elevation consistent with an acute STEMI requires ST elevation at the J point in two or more anatomically contiguous leads of at least two millimeters in V1, V2, or V3, and at least one millimeter when seen in any other lead. There is a benign variant of ST elevation called early repolarization or J-point elevation, though neither are very good terms. This variant results in the concave upwards ST elevation pattern, particularly in V2 and V3, though it can be seen in other leads as well. It is common in introductory EKG texts to comment on the fact that the concave upwards appearance looks like a smiley face and the convex appearance looks like a frown thus concluding that the concave appearance is benign and the convex appearance is dangerous. This is a very misleading oversimplification. While it is true that the convex, so-called frowny face morphology, is almost always indicative of a large acute MI, the concave upwards morphology is not necessarily benign. I've personally seen many patients with acute MIs 
whose ST segment morphology looked identical to what is frequently written off as early repolarization. Overall, the clinical context is more important than specific EKG characteristics when assessing a patient with ST segment elevations. When it comes to the etiologies of ST elevation, there is a surprisingly long list. Obviously, at the top is an MI, specifically what is referred to as an ST elevation MI, or STEMI. The other three common causes are left bundle branch block, left ventricular hypertrophy, and the normal variant just mentioned. The elevation present in these other three causes is usually, though not always, limited to leads V1 through V3. Other etiologies, which become increasingly more uh, rare or esoteric, include the early stage of pericarditis, a left ventricular aneurysm, coronary vasospasm, severe hyperkalemia, hypothermia, a genetic prorhythmic disease called Brugada syndrome, which we discussed in more detail in a future video, and finally, Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, also referred to as stress cardiomyopathy, but often referred to in the mainstream lay press as broken heart syndrome. When it comes to ST depressions, there are three morphologic subtypes. They are horizontal depressions, downsloping depressions, and upsloping depressions. Etiologies of ST depression include ischemia and infarction, tachycardia, digoxin, hypokalemia, conduction system disease, and ventricular hypertrophy, in which the combination of downsloping depressions and T-wave inversions comprise the so-called strain pattern. Etiologies of ST depressions can be categorized into primary repolarization abnormalities and secondary repolarization abnormalities. In secondary repolarization abnormalities, the ST segments are depressed due to the fact that the sequence of ventricular depolarization is abnormal. In other words, any time the QRS complex is severely abnormal, both the subsequent ST segment and the T wave in that same lead will likely be abnormal too. In primary repolarization abnormalities, as the term implies, the primary defect is in the process of repolarization itself, and the preceding QRS complex may or may not be totally normal. With T waves, their polarity in a normal EKG should be similar to that of the QRS complexes. Quantification of the similarity of polarity is referred to as the QRST angle. When evaluating only the six frontal EKG leads, the QRST angle is simply the difference between the QRS axis and the T wave axis, which can either be taken from the computer's calculation or estimated using a similar technique to that used for estimating QRS axis. An abnormally large angle may be an independent risk factor for cardiovascular mortality. There are a number of different abnormalities of the T wave. First, they can be inverted, which may be relatively minor, or can be very pronounced. Since T waves should have a similar polarity as the QRS complexes, it can be predicted in which leads T wave inversions may be normal. First, the T wave in AVR should always be inverted. Second, T wave inversion can be normal in lead 3 and AVF if the patient's QRS axis is close to 0 degrees. Also in AVL, if the patient has a QRS axis close to positive 90. And T wave inversions can be present in V1 and V2. There are many etiologies of inverted T waves. This list largely overlaps with those etiologies causing ST depressions. The three major additions include intracranial hemorrhage, in which case the T wave inversions are occasionally extremely dramatic, late stage pericarditis, and hypothyroidism. Instead of being inverted, T waves may also be flattened or even biphasic with both positive and negative components. The EKG machine algorithm will often interpret these as a nonspecific T wave abnormality. The etiologies of flattened or biphasic T waves are similar to those of inverted T waves. Finally, T waves may be unusually tall and or peaked. 
the presence of peaked T waves are usually diagnosed based on gestalt rather than on strict criteria. However, inconsistently applied criteria include T wave height of greater than 5 mm in the limb leads or 10 mm in the precordial leads. Etiologies of peak T waves include hyperkalemia, a normal variant which usually affects just the mid precordial leads, and rarely an acute MI, in which case they're called hyperacute T waves, and can immediately precede the development of ST elevations in those same leads. Occasionally, I've heard clinicians try to distinguish the etiologies of peak T waves based on their specific morphologic characteristics, while the hyperacute T waves generally have a broader base and can, for the most part, be distinguished from those of hyperkalemia. The T waves of hyperkalemia and the normal variant can be too similar to distinguish these etiologies on the basis of just the EKG. There are two last abnormalities I'm going to discuss in this video. These abnormalities typically affect all waveforms. The first is low voltage, as seen here. The presence of low voltage is defined as the presence of either a QRS amplitude in all limb leads of under 5 mm and or in all precordial leads of under 10 mm. Low voltage is the consequence of some insulating substance coming between the electrodes on the chest wall and the conduction system. Therefore, etiologies include obesity, COPD, in which the hyperinflated lungs act as insulation, a pleural or pericardial effusion, myocardial infiltration, and hypothyroidism. In hypothyroidism, proposed explanations include occult pericardial effusion and or occult ascites and soft tissue edema of the chest wall, among others. The last abnormality of this video is electrical alternance. This is a beat-to-beat -beat alteration in the appearance of waveforms. It most commonly manifests as a tall R wave alternating with a short one. The only significant cause of this is a large pericardial effusion in which the heart literally rocks back and forth within a distended pericardial sac with each contraction. Although electrical alternands can be seen in effusions significant enough to cause cardiac tamponade, the presence of alternands does not necessarily suggest tamponade specifically. That concludes this video on QRST changes. The next video in this EKG series will cover myocardial infarctions in more depth.